Hello, everyone, and welcome to the July Financial Markets Mortgage Subgroup Meeting. Before we get started, I'd like to express our appreciation to the Financial Markets Special Industry Group, and we'll talk a bit more detail about that, and the Hyperledger Foundation for their ongoing support. They really helped us out and get this group off the ground and provide continuing support. So I always want to express our appreciation at the beginning. Okay, uh, as always, please note that this meeting is being recorded and is under the umbrella of the Hyperledger Foundation. So we ask that everyone abide by the antitrust policy and code of conduct. Uh, excuse me, conduct. The antitrust policy states that we will avoid discussions of company specific pricing, products, and projects, and we won't make negative comments about other companies or products. The code of conduct means that we trust, e excuse me, we treat each other with respect, we don't discriminate, we can, and we communicate constructively. We fully support Hyperledger's policy of openness, equity, and inclusion, and for new your new participants, we welcome you. And if you'd like to introduce yourself, please do so in the chat. If there's anything that you're interested in hearing about or discussing, please do so in the chat. We wanna make this as open a forum as possible. Here's our agenda for today. Uh, again, please feel free to ask questions or submit questions to the chat. This is an open forum and the more discussion that we have, the better and really everyone benefits from the interaction. This slide we always cover at the beginning of each slide because really this slide underscores the purpose of this group. This is to reinforce that we're all on the same blockchain path, although we may be at different points along the path. This approach that we followed it is to demonstrate number one, the feasibility of blockchain through mortgage industry use cases and define potential implementation paths for the mortgage industry. We're all on the same path. We just may be at different points in the path. So one of, this is one of our basic tenets. Um, I, I wanted to have, or, or just do a brief PSA from the Hyperledger community. I'm sure you guys noticed in the slides that we have and the way we've been mentioning our special interest group, the capital markets special interest group has changed its name to the financial markets uh, special interest group. The wiki has been updated. The capital markets mailing list has been migrated. If you have not moved your email address to the financial markets mailing list, please do so. Um, we also have the Discord and the LinkedIn, so all of those items have been changed. And if we do miss anything that still says capital markets, please let us know. But this change is really intended to underscore that we're a much broader special interest group. Although capital markets is still a key area, we're now the financial markets special interest group. Okay. The next three slides I always mention, uh, but I go through very uh, quickly. These slides are intended to uh, help new people uh, get an introduction to who we are and to provide them more information. So uh, this slide provides the different resources that are available from the Linux Foundation all the way down uh, there to the arrow that shows our wiki. So that information is available. And these are great resources. Uh, on this slide, if you would like to avail yourself of those resources, this is how you get an LFID and how to join our group. Then we have the blockchain training slides. These uh, resources are free and they're actually fantastic. I've taken this training, so I highly recommend them. Okay, with that, why don't we dive into the next major section and James will walk us through the state of the blockchain in the global mortgage industry. Excellent, thank you, Marvin. Uh, let's go ahead and advance on to the next slide. So yeah, here is our global market blockchain activity. Again, this is updated showing the various articles we've talked about in the previous meetings, along with the two new ones uh, down in the bottom and the lower right. You know, the theme for today's uh, presentation um, uh, is on consortiums. 
Uh, we've talked about it a bit before and, you know, just a level set for everybody if you're not familiar with it. So consortiums are an association of two or more entities. They may be companies, organizations, or government agencies with a, a common objective of participating in activities or pooling their resources for achieving a specific goal. Um, go ahead and move on to the next slide, Marvin. So, you know, as, as we talk about consortiums, you know, one of the big things I wanted to open up with is, you know, what are the different considerations that you should think about? Uh, Mayor Brown uh, put out a great article relevant to this, and I thought their opening actually was a great catch um, statement that most blockchain technologies are developed by foundations or consortia the members of which are often representatives of the industry, hoping to create and successfully deploy the technology. Um, the article goes into for consortiums, um, what are some of those critical aspects that you need to you know, pay attention to as companies come together to collectively play a part? They talk about governance, uh, the importance of it to define the goals, the number of participants, the levels of interests and roles that each of the members of a consortia will play, um, intellectual property, agreeing who will own or be able to utilize the developed technology is critical to the, the success of a consortia. And they frequently require members to contribute their own software, materials, and know-how to the project. And there's also antitrust considerations. So to avoid information being shared that may give rise to antitrust claims, it's critical to ensure that antitrust uh, rules of the roads are documented, they're prepared, they're explained at regular intervals for each of the representatives. You know, in summary for this article, there's a number of components that businesses um, involved in a consortia will need to determine to successfully develop and implement within any industry. So as we look at the second article, this is a great example coming out of Australia. There's a new platform called Ligon. It started as a pilot back in 2019 by Westpac and ANZ. And over time, they were joined by uh, Commonwealth Bank, Center Group, along with IBM over the last three years. Ligon digitizes previously manual paper-based bank guarantee processes. It enable, it's enabling processes that traditionally would take a month to complete. They can now complete within a 24-hour period. In Australia, bank guarantees are used to secure contracts as part of retail property lease and as an alternative to a deposit or a bond. The bank provides an unconditional undertaking to pay one party in the event of another's default. Ligon runs on IBM's public cloud and significantly reduces the risk of fraud, um, uh, of fraud and potential for errors throughout this process. You know, as an additional note, the Ligon platform is garnering more and more attention across Australia, not only within the finance industry, but within the retail industries as well. Um, on to the next slide, Marvin. So, you know, here's the US mar uh, mortgage blockchain activity that we've discussed before. If you look at there at the top of 2022, um, back in our January meeting, uh, it was within days before that meeting, the USDF consortium was announced. And we had the opportunity to, uh, you know, talk about what is their purpose and their goal and what were they looking to achieve. The actual, the two next articles we're gonna talk about there at the bottom actually both wrap around the USDF consortium. Um, let's go ahead and flip to the next slide, Marvin. So, you know, as mentioned, we talked about this in January. The goal of the USDF uh, group is to have a stable coin as an on-ramp to facilitate real-time payments, loan and security processings on a blockchain platform. The founding bank members of this consortium included New York Community Bank, NBH Bank, First Bank, Sterling National Bank, and Synovus Bank, working in conjunction with, conjunction with fintech companies from Figure Technologies and Jam Fintop. 
Back in January on the 19th post our meeting, they actually completed the first transaction on the Providence blockchain, where NBH banks sent self-minted USDF to a, or a customer of New York Community Bank. The launch of the USDF consortium is one of the latest examples of community banks proactively exploring technologies to strengthen their competitiveness. This article also discusses the costs and benefits of these endeavors. So if you're interested in what's if you're interested in what's going on in this area or you'd like to learn more about the USDF consortium, Take a look at this article article, or just Google USDF consortium and you can go directly to their website, but they are actively making pros progress and it's a great example here in the US of community banks that are getting together and actually developing blockchains that will have an impact for the mortgage industry. And then the last article that I've got on here from Yahoo Finance, um, you know, last month we had a variety of podcasts that we shared with the group. Um, for those of you that are more into, you know, getting your information through video, I wanted to do include this one. It continues on with the USDF consortium discussion. It's a seven minute video an interview done by Coindex or Coindesk TV um, with First Bank Chief Administrator Administrative Officer Wade Perry. He shares his insight into the consortium and the state of stable coins. He discusses how stable coins are designed to be a one-to-one -one digital marker for a US dollar and how these digital markers will be insured by FDIC and consumer protection laws. Um, collaboration of technologies, bankers, and regulators, including the OCC, FDIC, Federal Reserve, who are actively contributing feedback to the USDF. So it, it's a great interview. I highly recommend taking the time. It's only seven minutes long. Highly recommend taking the time to take a look. All of these articles are available on the uh, um, mortgage subgroup page. In fact, Marvin, if you'll move to the next slide on that one. And I'm gonna drop into, it looks like Alma actually dropped into chat the new link for the FMSIG mortgage industry subgroup page, what you're seeing here on this current slide. So I recommend opening up the chat, clicking on that link. Um, making it a favorite. You'll see we've got the new articles that we've discussed here. There's links to them. You can get to the video that I mentioned. In addition, for all the information Marvin covered up front with those various links, how to set up your LFID, et cetera, we do include those monthly in each one of these presentations. And over on the far left there, you'll see the various meeting notes from each of our presentations. So if you ever need those links, uh, you know, just follow one of those pages, you'll be able to get to the presentation and within the presentation, it will encapsulate all these links for you. And that is the state of the industry for the month of July. I'll pass it back over to you, Marvin, unless anyone has any questions. James, I, I did have a question. I attended a presentation by the Hyperledger Foundation yesterday where they were talking about stable coins. And, and one of the key concerns that was raised by several people in the audience was interoperability of those stable coins, especially when they were being advocated by a particular consortium. So one of the questions asked, and I'm going to pose it to you, is do you see any issues with with interoperability across these consortiums? And do you see any type of, of convergence migration towards commonality or interoperability? Because for example, we're yeah. part of the Hyperledger Foundation, but Stellar, a different blockchain, they have their own foundation. And I know we try to work interoperable, interoperable if that's a word with them. So I, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, great question, Marvin. And, you know, in particular, watching what's going on with the crypto markets yeah. um, and how they're being impacted by what's going on in, uh, you know, the financial industries, it's really too hard to tell at this point. You know, USDF, it is tying itself to the US dollar. Um, and USDF is only being traded amongst the member associations within the USDF consortia. I think as 
as that continues to build, I think as we continue to see what happens with the markets um, and with other, you know, crypto sources, it will be interesting to see if, you know, stablecoin is the long term lasting that's going to, you know, outlive Bitcoin and other things or whether or not that crypto market is really going to start picking back up again as we get through some of these inflation risks and concerns, um, and whether or not they'll be able to tie together or have any sort of you know, meaningful relationship with the stablecoin markets. OK, excellent. Yet uh, the new stablecoin that they're advocating yesterday is USDF+. Plus. So well, when you and I get a chance, uh, I'll, I'll give you some of the more details about it. I don't purport to understand anything about it. All I know is the acronym. <laughs> no, that's great, Marvin. Thanks for sharing. OK, thanks, James. OK, uh, the next group that I would like to introduce, I'd like to introduce you guys to James Schoening and Casey Rock. Uh, these are two individuals from the IM Project. The IM Project is a Hyperledger Fabric project whose charter is to develop a verifiable data registry solution that will provide individuals with decentralized identity, including a digital wallet. So James, Casey, welcome to the group. Well, Marvin, thanks for having us. Marvin, um, and, and let me just um, tell you where what our sweet spot is. You know, we're not trying to reinvent. A lot of people are working on digital identity, things like that, and we're using some of that. But but our sweet spot is in the area of uh, what could be called a personal data store. Okay, so so we heard hear terms like digital wallet. Uh, some people can have different uh, opinions on what that really means. Sometimes it could be called a cloud agent, but it's basically what a person, a person keeps their digital assets, you know, whether it be credentials or data, things like that, um, or even, you know, maybe even Bitcoins. Um, so that is our sweet spot. And, and we do think that that has an application within the mortgage industry um, because the individual is obviously a, an important part of the, that ecosystem. And if the individual can collect all their key data and credentials in a standard format, that could facilitate the process of uh, granting mortgages and reselling mortgages, things like that. Um, Marvin, I'm, I'm glad you put up that slide on the roadmap, uh, starting with ideation and then the proof of concept and pilot and production. <clears throat> um, so this topic we're discussing, we're discussing the idea. And at, at an upcoming meeting, perhaps in a couple of weeks, um, and I believe Casey, Casey, who is, is developing the our test bed, um, you know, we will be giving a technology demonstration. I don't know that that would be rise to the level of proof of concept, but um, it's on the path. It's on that path, on that roadmap. And our goal is to to get some other collaborators um, within this mortgage and within this mortgage use case. Um, and to uh, you know work towards a proof of concept and then maybe even a pilot. So, so that, that is gonna be our goal. Um, to say a bit more about uh, personal data systems, there's actually a consortium mostly in Europe um, called the My Data Global. And that's, I, I believe they have 37 startup companies. Most of them are building personal data systems, but our approach we feel is unique and more viable than the other 37 players because um, data, you can have data from a hundred different sources, but you bring it together, it doesn't fit. It has different meaning. You can't automatically bring data together and have it work together because it was it, each has its own unique schema and it has different semantics. Um, and the semantics usually aren't even defined, let alone documented. Um, but what we use to integrate data are standard ontologies. That might that word might be foreign to many people here, but it's the it's a new form of a data model. And um, uh, we and some of our colleagues have a, have passed an ISO standard for a top level ontology. <clears throat> um, we have a very mature mid level ontology, and we're ready. And we are now building out a what we call a my data ontology. And that, that is going to include many of the key, 
pieces of information that an individual needs to have to apply for a mortgage. So uh, I think one of the strongest use cases in the mortgage field is if, if a person can collect all their own data in a standard format, then they can, they can take bids from uh, mortgage lenders and they may be able to uh, you know, not have a need for mortgage brokers. I'm not sure if there's any mortgage brokers on this call, but uh, um, I mean, we all know what happened to travel agents, um, you know, when the internet came about. So the same thing could work in the mortgage area. So, so, we, so we'll be doing a demonstration uh, coming up, you know, when we can get on your next agenda and, um, and we'll be looking for collab. That's what we really need is collaborators because we have key parts of the puzzle, but not all the parts. <laughs> Uh, so we couldn't do it completely on our own. So, uh, Casey, did you want to fill in any gaps I may have missed? Yeah, absolutely. I'll talk about yes. uh, the data. So one thing that Jim mentioned is if people could collect their own data, then present it to a bank who could offer them a mortgage, that sounds great. But one of the problems is, is what if somebody for forges their data or spoofs their data? They write incorrect information. Uh, well, one of the things that we've realized is with this verifiable credential model, we're allowing other organizations, a third party organization to digitally sign this piece of information. And we would store that in our personal data store. So now when we go to present the data to the bank or whoever is issuing out the, the loan, they'd be able to reference that verifiable data and prove who the owner of that data was or who the creator or issuer of that data. So now there's this trust established because a lot of the stuff Hyperledger does is, from what we looked at on our end, is you use the blockchain to distribute out these keys, there's rotation processes, but ultimately it establishes a root of trust where we can prove that the data is authentic and it has been uh, created by a certain issuer. In our case, we're working with the holder. This personal data store will facilitate the process a holder will use when storing their data. Now, when somebody wants to verify the data, such as the bank, they would select claims to the holder and we'd present these verifiable data. So when James, uh, Jim Shoney says, we're collecting data, this is verifiable data that somebody could then use to uh, check the authenticity of it. So that's kind of our claim. And since it's a standard model and we're trying to keep interoperability in mind at first, the goal is that more and more people start to conform to our data models and our standards this is going to allow the interoperability of data to flow from one system to the other. So now when we start to integrate data from third-party vendors, it's going to fit really nice into the models that we're creating. Okay, hey, uh, James, uh, Casey, one of the things that we've already done is I've shared with you the MISMO data model or, or list of all of the MISMO Perfect. data fields. So. When you guys take a look at that, I, I've highlighted for you guys the fields that I thought would be uh, most important. Um, is that a sufficient starting point for your project to start to identify the common data fields? Because I only highlighted personal information, not property information, employment information, anything like that. When you guys start talking about data, that's unique to an individual, how far or what are some of those common data fields that you guys are utilizing? And, and the second question, it, what are you guys looking for in terms of collaboration? Volunteers, you guys mentioned that, companies, I mean, speak a little bit about that because th this is gonna be the, the group of people that I think would ideally be able to collaborate with. Okay, um, the answer to as, as to which data fields are needed, and, and I think that would, that the, the bank who wants to issue a mortgage is going to tell you what data they need. And, and that's, and we, we, whatever that is, we can build it into our standard ontologies. And, um, and then the MISMO model would not need to change. We can map to any other, you know, 
data well. That's what that's what the you know big benefit of ontologies are. We we can do a mapping between them. So if some some bank is using the MISMO model for some internal application. If, the, if that's how they run their assessments using MISMO, that, then our standard ontologies would just do a mapping and uh, the data would be transformed and it would speak the MISMO language. Because um, our, our models are will be user centric. So when we do this, we're not doing it just for the mortgage um, use case. It'll be for you know, buying insurance or you know, you buy a new car, you get all the data about your car and then it tells you when you need to get an oil change or whatever. Um, so uh, um, <clears throat> it can work with, with MISMO. Um, but now to your other, as far as collaborators go, um, subject matter experts, be people who understand the mortgage ecosystem. We, we are not mortgage experts. I've, I've had a few in my lifetime, but uh, that's my level of expertise. Um, so, so just subject matter experts that may not be, not understand our technology at all. Um, people who understand the data. It, to have a bank that would be, you know, willing to uh, review an application that was in a a, a different format, you know, or, or that, you know, maybe a bank shows us their data model and then we map our data and then transform, that would be a good proof of concept where we can transform our data into their, their model and see if they can then automatically assess a mortgage application. That I think would be a, a great proof of concept and, and it would only take one, one person um, to, to, to test it with. Um, and it could lead to a, you know, a, a larger pilot. Um, so, I hope that answered some of your questions. Casey, oh, did you want to add? Oh. No, I mean, I, th I think you definitely yeah, yeah, hit yeah. the nail on the head when you talked about the, the different models that we can integrate to. Essentially what the ontologies facilitate is you have one data model, we transform it into an ontology. And then when you need to take that data out, you can use the previous mapping to turn it back into the proper format. So if you can imagine there's 10 different data models that all have been mapped to our ontology, that data, that we store would be in the ontology format. However, as we want to, you know, give it back out or, or transform it back out, it'll then be set to the, the standard or the mapping version of it. So yeah, that's that's pretty much um the biggest thing that we advocate with ontologies. Okay, great, thank you. And, and as I said, this is the audience that I, I think would definitely be able to help you and collaborate with you and, and serve as test cases. So to the rest of the team, uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do with James and Casey is get them on one of our future meetings so that they can do the actual technical demonstration that they were talking about. We already have someone uh, slated for August. So maybe um, if you guys think you'll be ready for September or October, let me know and we'll get you onto our calendar. Uh, I think I'm excited to see what you guys are doing and I think the rest of the audience is as well. Perfect. I'm going to I'm going to send a link in the chat. This is going to be to our discord. If anybody wants to join and feel free to contact us, this is probably the best way to do it. And then I'll put a link into our GitHub page. So this is a uh, or a Linux Foundation project as well. So anybody can go on, view it, and join it as, uh, as you'd like. So these will all be in the chat. Casey, James, I too want to, you know, thank you guys for joining us today. And we are definitely looking forward to that presentation. You know, I'm curious, um, you know, as James, you kind of called out, Marvin talked about that roadmap and, you know, where people are at. As you guys have been going along with your journey, um, obviously industry expertise is going to be critical for your needs. But I'm curious if you can share with the group, what are one or two of the other biggest challenges you guys have faced and how did you go about you know, overcoming those hurdles? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that we've faced is learning the, the Aries in the stack. I mean, that's what a lot of the blockchain technology was based off of. We came into this new to it. I mean, our claim to fame was standard ontologies. So when we tried to figure out more use cases for it, we had to learn a whole new stack to do so. Now that's something that we're still learning. And, and if anybody is an expert in Aries, uh, specifically their cloud um, Occupy, it was the cloud Python, Aries cloud Python uh, controller agent, we'd definitely be interested in doing that because ultimately 
all of these transactions that we take place are going to be using uh, Aries and either India as the blockchain or some other layer one technology. That's kind of um, what we foresee in the future is a, a subject matter expert that we're needing. Now, ultimately, like I said, we are uh, standard ontologies. That's our bread and butter. So anybody else who's dabbled with this field or has worked with other uh, organizations that built tech demos, we'd love to, to figure out how we can um, collaborate in that sense. James, any additional thoughts to add to that? I think you might, there you go. Um, yeah, um, I, think, I think Casey gave you a pretty good example there. I mean, I mean I, I've been dealing with, with standard ontologies for 25 years, so we've overcome, I mean, just, just getting the top level ontology approved as an ISO standard, that, that took years in, in, the, in the process. And we, and we now have a very mature mid-level ontology and we're, we're in, in the standardization process there. And, and we, will, you know, we will be building out this My Data ontology and plan to standardize it also. Um, so that's, that's always a challenge. Um, so I think that's, those are a couple of good examples. Excellent, fantastic. And I, I appreciate you guys sharing your Discord channel because that's definitely becoming a uh, you know much more collaborative tool that people are using. I've also dropped in the chat, the Mortgage SIG Discord channel as well for everybody mm -hmm. to grab that link. Any other questions for James and Casey before we move on to the next topic? Okay, James, Casey, thank you very much for attending. We definitely appreciate it. Um, I'll reach out to some people that I know that do have Aries uh, skill sets and I'll let you know if they're able to help you out. Perfect, let's do that. We'll uh, looking forward to that introduction. Okay, thank you guys. And we, and we will be ready for your, whenever, whenever you're having room on your agenda, I think Casey uh, could do that demo. Okay, awesome. We'll, we'll coordinate offline, thank you guys. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, our next speaker is Mike McCoy. I see him uh, online. He is the senior product manager for D5 for Block Daemon. He is starting a new subgroup in the, the financial market, SIG, focused on distributed finance or DeFi. I saw his initial proposal to the financial market SIG and I immediately saw the value in this new subgroup and the synergies with our mortgage subgroup. So with that, uh, Mike, take it away. Welcome to our group. Hey everyone, Marvin, thanks for the great intro and uh, a pleasure to be here, pleasure to be here. Uh, this is my first mortgage uh, subgroup meeting, unfortunately, but hopefully it could be uh, the first of many more in the future. So, uh, so yeah, uh, a little bit about, about myself before I share my screen. Uh, I'm at work at Block Damon. I've been here since March 1st. Uh, I'm, I'm a product manager for our DeFi and our staking components. So uh, we do two things at the company I work at. We run nodes for large institutions and large companies. Uh, and then we also uh, create a staking and a financial component of that. Think of it as more like a, co a commodities component and ability to trade and be able to earn yield on uh, staking and, and blockchain infrastructure. But I really wanted to, I, I, for years, I actually, prior to proposing for this DeFi subgroup, I actually ran the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group for about two years, uh, working at previous healthcare institutions and, and other businesses. And I, I felt there was a lot of similarities in healthcare and finance and these type of applications. And right now, more than ever, uh, in kind of my presentation, I want to prove out why DeFi is kind of a more uh, promising component than centralized finances today for our traditional financial systems and how I kind of see uh, the macro and everything shaping up there. So I will share my screen. Give me one moment. Uh, I need to be considered a host. Oh, no, never mind. I'm good. All right, give me one so moment. I will, there you go. All right, I'm just gonna put it in presentation mode. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yep, it's loading. It is loading. There you uh, go. You guys can see it or in the presenter view? Yeah, you're just starting the slideshow view. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm trying to get in presenter mode so I can see my notes and things on the side. There you go. 
Awesome. All right. So crypto macro and DeFi summary presentation for you all. Awesome. So where are we coming from, right? So right now in, in DeFi today, right, we had a lot of really unfortunate steps that came to the process this past spring and summer. We all are pretty uh, aware of uh, Terra and their collapse in the, the Luna peg and, and, and Anchor and, and everything that went there. And then recently we're seeing a lot of centralized finance companies uh, really collapse and go into bankruptcy or insolvency, such as Three Arrows Capital, BlockFi, and Celsius and Voyager. Uh, a lot, all four of these companies, uh, other than Terra, have a lot in common. And the thing they have in common is they are a centralized third party that are then taking in crypto finances and then distributing and putting them to the necessary means they believe are most valuable. Not following a protocol, not necessarily following a governance board or even a board of directors at all. They are more so just managing funds and sh shifting and sending them to other entities. And so that is kind of the recent events that have made people a little bit scared of DeFi, that have made them a little bit more cautious of it and may not want to step their toes into it uh, as much into the future. But crypto is more than just those centralized components. Crypto is a, or, and DeFi is a large ecosystem. And this is just the ecosystem on Ethereum itself, on the EVM cluster. There is Cosmos, it's a benefit and Tendermint uh, clusters that are coming out as a beneficial uh, protocol. Polygon, Solana, and all these are, are becoming very other valuable clusters beyond just the Ethereum space. And so uh, one, personally, I believe in a multi-chain world, but I also believe that we're shifting in a, a crypto and a DeFi uh, system into an oligopoly, where it is the winner of its uh, winner take most, not winner take all, where there's about four to six, maybe five uh, large companies that will be able to dominate in certain services but then decentralized access so that uh, there's not one just dominant player in the marketplace there. And so you're seeing some of these things like in the Lido liquid staking uh, component where they have about 85% of dominance, some would say. Uh, uh, publicly, they, they announced that they have about 33% of all Ethereum liquid staking. But when it comes to all liquid staking across tokens and across clusters, they have about 85%. And so, you know, talking about this dominance feature and talking about decentralization as much as possible, uh, I think we need to get a little bit more granular on how and what we're uh, trying to promote in that space. And so I just wanted to show a couple of things about how we got here and why. So DeFi was just very quick. I mean, I remember in like around summer of 18 and even in the spring of 2019, uh, people were talking about decentralized finance and it was coming around the bend, but it really didn't take off until the pandemic and people were a little bit more focused online, but they could probably read a little bit more about these uh, very uh, dense topics. And so we got to about a value of nearly 300 billion in a matter of about a year. And then now in the recent downturn, we're hovering around 100 billion to 111 billion of crypto assets. But that is a really quick turnaround. And of course, you're going to see up and down in volatility over time. But that's kind of why I think we're, we're really in an immature state right now in this space. Now, uh, around this time, though, we, we had peak kind of crypto asset and DeFi numbers coming around the end of uh, 2021, as you can see here. And then when the Terra Luna crash happened, you know, a bunch of money, people took their money out. But then also, if you see around week 18 and week 20, you see a lot more institutions buying the dip, uh, kind of almost mirroring some of the, the, the charts and the prices from the, the end of 2021. But then as you see here around week 25, 26, 27, that's when a lot more people are, are taking their money out and maybe trusting DeFi a little bit less. Or is this DeFi? Because I would argue that's more the centralized finance components, the BlockFi's, the Celsius, the Voyagers of the world that really unfortunately failed our, our, our ecosystem a little bit. Now also recently from a macro perspective, we're seeing numbers such as stable coins are getting more adoption today and then NFTs unfortunately going down. And I just showed uh, two examples and this isn't, I'm just trying to generalize like briefly in, in the type of ecosystems. People, especially that are managing large amounts of crypto assets and crypto finances, wanted to be able to go into a stable type of yield. And so I'll, after the UST collapsed, most people went into a USDC or in circles uh, stablecoin. Whereas the Board API Club, the famous uh, NFT community, saw a large portion of their community take out their funds, take out their gains, 
and unfortunately are, are not holding as many NFTs. And, and for the most part, ever since then, NFTs are kind of going down. Even Coinbase NFT numbers in the week, uh, the week before 4th of July, I, I believe they only had seven new signups, which is very, very bad for an enterprise that is at that scale to be able to, to compete with their numbers. But then I think a lot of times this next bear and bull run will be very different. There's a massive increase in VC money relative to the prior cycle of money coming in before. And the, rec and the prior crashes of Ethereum and, and crypto in general, uh, you see here around 2018, 2019, that was when you know, there wasn't as much VC money and there wasn't as much support to keep some of these companies alive. And it, the blue is VC money invested. The orange is uh, Bitcoin to USD that is put in by retailers or, or traders, et cetera. And so this time around, though, we're having billions and billions of dollars more coming into the space, including Andreessen Horowitz with a $4.5 billion fund. Uh, recently, we just saw, I believe, Multicoin with $400 million, $450 million fund coming into the space and a bunch of others that are really trying to support these startups looking at this next build season and what are the tools and applications and automation features that are really going to make this possible for us to onboard everyone into this space. And DeFi and crypto, to me, at least in my opinion, is not going to go away. One, uh, the Bank of International Settlements uh, this past spring released some features about how DeFi actually brings a lot of operational value add. Now, as I have here, imagine using DeFi to operate a global 24-7 infrastructure with almost no marginal and operational labor costs. A lot of financial institutions are really getting into these type of mechanisms, and it's going to save the space a ton of money and also bring a ton of earnings to the space as well. But with that, you're going to see a little bit more um, survivor-like tactics. One, so in centralized finance companies, we see their money go away as they've, you know, they didn't have a proper protocol or method to do this. But we're seeing the DeFi protocols, the makers, the Aves, the compounds, the native true decentralized finance protocols that are actually succeeding in this market and somewhat flatlining, but not going down to the bottom where a lot of people would project it would be. And so this is part of the value adds you need to, you need to tell people why DeFi is actually use, uh, valuable. And a lot of enterprises and a lot of traditional finance institutions may not be fully aware of this yet. And what are the differences between DeFi and CeFi? Well, one, are the financial assets controlled by the user non-custodial? If not, that's definitely centralized finance. Can someone single-handedly censor transaction or execution? Can a third party be able to uh, stop that, stop withdrawal, uh, withdrawal opportunities, stop deposit opportunities? If that is, that's centralized finance intermediary and they do DeFi settlement. And can someone single-handedly censor the protocol execution? Like, can someone just stop the bank? Uh, rather than the actual individual, can they stop the actual bank? If so, then that's centrally governed DeFi protocol, such as BlockFi, such as uh, Celsius, such as Voyager. And if not, it's a truly DeFi component. And we need a lot more education in the space, but we also need a lot more examples of how people are using it today and when what it's good for. So I'll give some more uh, examples of how it's beneficial for fund transfer and some companies that are doing that, asset trading, derivatives trading, a secured lending and unsecured lending. And, and really like crypto, I think of it as crypto as an asset class. Like we have to compare crypto to then traditional financial markets, such as cash as like a money market or bonds, fixed income. And what you all are probably familiar with is real assets and, and public equities and, and private equity. And so we need to be able to get real world assets on board and actually uh, traditional financial assets into this type of decentralized world to really see if this brings meaningful value. But at first, that's a little bit scary because real world assets and the decentralized environments, that can be a big question mark for a lot of people. Why would I want volatility of crypto just to have a risk of making money and not have uh, the security there? So I wanted to show kind of a little bit under the hood of when DeFi is done right. So in MakerDown specifically, uh, this is as of July, 2022, they have about 3.5 billion assets uh, in crypto assets specifically in their price stability mechanism vaults. This is when, if you have a proposal and you are a user in the MakerDAO and you propose to join uh, the consortia, or sorry, you pr propose to join the DAO, your money and your funds and your assets get, get, uh, keep, get, get stored, sorry, into the price stability mechanism vaults. And in here, 
this is how they do it under the hood. They have a claim on stables. They have a claim on crypto. Stables is a stable coin. And then they also have a crude surplus, the fees it costs to actually be part of the network and be part of the, the DAO. But they also have a separate amount of tokens that come there. That's kind of like a fee structure, if you want to think of it, that are trading on crypto in, in their own type of fund that they strategically have to get approval from the rest of the group to actually put into. And then they also have liabilities such as minting and providing security for the Ethereum network. And the more mint you have, the more secure your network is, generally speaking. And they also have system surplus for there as well, for the staff that's part of there as well. But generally, if you want to think about the staff that supports MakerDAO, it's in the hundreds of people. I think there may be 100 to maybe 250, 300 active developers and active users that are keeping this afloat. And they have a, a, a positive run rate of 3.5 billion. So <laughs> that's nothing to sneeze at. That's less people, more power. And I think a lot of people in finance are, are really going to take note of this. Um, Mike, lot, yeah. I, I'm sorry, uh, before I proceed to the next slide, I, I think that was a great use case. Can you define what a DAO is for some people in the audience that, that aren't familiar with DAOs? Yeah, yeah, of course. So a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. That is the definition of it. But a DAO is really just like an online community of people that the criteria to join to this DAO is you have to have an internet connection. You need to be able to review proposals and you need to have a certain amount of crypto and you can be accepted into the DAO. So it's a group of community individuals that if you want to be part of the DAO, you propose to this governance board, which is hundreds of people on the internet. They accept you. You connect your crypto wallet and some of the crypto assets you have to be uh, kept in the price stability mechanism, as I just mentioned here. And then that verifies that you are part of there. You have certain dues and certain fees like you do with any club or any asset group, any bank. And then, uh, but it, the, one of the differences in the DAO too is that in order to vote on proposals, you vote with, with your money. So if I'm a maker DAO and I, I see a proposal and I definitely disagree with it, I vote yay or nay onto that and I put X amount of capital. The people who have the most amount of capital in the yay or nay actually move on for the proposal to, to either it goes yes or it's no. And so you actually vote with your money which is a, a very interesting concept. And some can think of that as, you know, there's a lot of behavioral economic uh, theories according to it. But generally, I think it makes you a little bit more um, truthful and a little bit more honest when it comes to your true intentions and how and what you want the, the DAO and the network to, to perform in the future. So uh, yeah, so that's a good example of it. Uh, excellent, thank you. Awesome. And then uh, one thing, cause we, I talked about Terra earlier, right? And here's more things under the hood of what ALGO stable coins are compared to, right? So there's MakerDAO, the one I just mentioned earlier. There's FRAX, which uh, goes into this uh, function called a curve pool. A curve pool is when you take about three to four, sometimes more cryptos into this, um, this pool, and then they average out the, the price of the curve to be able to allow you to lend or borrow due to the different crypto assets you have as an individual group. Uh, so Frax does this with the curve pool and be able to lend and borrow and hold it within Frax. They have other liquidity, but then they have a lot of intangible assets. Part of the reason that Terra actually really fell and really uh, collapsed was because they had way too many intangible assets. They were giving people 20% APY in Anchor. Anchor was this protocol where you could just park your money, receive 20% APY. I think the you only had to lock up your tokens for about 28 days, something like that, 30 days. And then you get your 20% APY, which was very concerning. Sometimes if you had enough crypto, I believe you can get these automatically out of Anchor as well. So uh, Terra just like was borrowing all this money without actually having it collateralized. And that's kind of what screwed them in the end because they didn't actually have reserves to keep the, the party going. And they had some L1 reserves, which was mostly Bitcoin, some Ethereum, but uh, that's kind of what came to their, their fall. So on here on the top right, you see fiat-backed, crypto-backed, and algorithmic stablecoins. Here's some of the key differences between them. And fiat-backed stablecoins, as you can imagine, have stability and capital efficiency, uh, but crypto-backed ones have some sorts of de decentralization. And if they're stable coins, they create stability for you as well. Algorithmic though, it's kind of like using a bot to try and predict human behavior when it comes to trading. And as we saw in this last run, it's never perfect. I still think that 
there is room in research and examples where algorithmic stablecoins can be truly valuable, maybe in administrative functions and uh, of, of swapping uh, agreements and assets via smart contracts, but we still have a long way to go in that field. And on the bottom right, we just have some examples of how an algorith algorithmic stablecoins can be successful, they can be, or set, they can be reflexive, they can be anchored in, into money. And I think generally speaking, most people would say that the most successful version of algorithmic stablecoins is DAI um, as, a, as a particular method here. Uh, generally, like I'm not a financial advisor, you know, this is not financial advice, but generally this is where people tend to see more, most success uh, within these marketplaces. But definitely when you have an algorithmic stable coin that's very reflexive and can automatically like transfer funds whenever they want to, it's a, it's a little bit of a problem there. So what I'm just trying to get at is we need to do a lot more research in these spaces. More things are under the hood of DeFi versus TradFi is the Fed and how they uh, create their assets and their liabilities, as well as Fi. Fi is another protocol that's similar to Frax and, uh, and similar to Terra but it has a lot more ETH investments that bring real world value and like mint in mind to the actual network and bring actual value to it rather than some of these other projects. And so what I'm just trying to get at again is research needs to be done. We need to take more time and find the best examples and angles here. And so it's part of like what I want to do within DeFi subgroup in Hyperledger is to create models similar to this of what can we think of a better model for algorithmic stable coins? When we're thinking about you know, what, you know, what makes an algo stable coin successful, I think it is velocity. How easy, easy is it to set a stable, uh, how easy is it for a stable to scale up? Solvency, how reliable is the value backing the currency? What's it pegged to? What's, it actually, what's the main storage value? Is it in mining? Is it in building up the network? Is it in security? Is it in holding real world assets? Is it in holding mortgages, holding equities? Things like that. And then liquidity as well how many times is a transfer? Is there a transfer fee? What do those fees look like? Are they, uh, is it mercenary capital where you're just taking it from retailers? Is it more institutional? Is it, you know, this or that? And the holy grail is getting all three of these right. But as of today in crypto and DeFi, we don't have a perfect system for this. And I don't know if we ever will, but we want to get somewhere close to the center when it comes to uh, creating the next, next, next mechanism for this. And as I said before, TradFi is getting into these products. And uh, as you can see here, uh, with recent research that came out uh, this past May, a lot of banks are actually using uh, crypto when it comes to uh, everyday, they're using crypto products for uh, their traditional uses, or sorry, traditional use cases, such as one, tokenization of real assets, like potentially mortgages, PNB Paribus, uh, Deutsche Bank, Northern Trust, and uh, and SG are all working on tokenizing real assets. They formally considered it and were working in POCs for it. Uh, these ones that are fully black are the ones that are actually functional. Uh, and so you could think about all the use cases within mortgages that could really be useful here. Real-time payments for network using crypto, maybe real-time payment on your mortgage, real-time payment with your, your renters and things like that. So issuance of stable coins ton of use cases that are, are definitely beneficial for the group. And my last, side, my last side here, slide here is that DeFi is moving towards legitimacy. Right now we have compounds, enterprise arm, received an S&P credit score. It was a B minus grade, which is not great <laughs> overall, but I think some of the um, measuring characteristics when it came to DeFi in this uh, example, were a little bit too early and may not get the full picture. Uh, yes, it's a little bit risky, but that's because it's decentralized and you're, you're interacting with anonymous users. But with those anonymous users comes a, a governance board and a consortium like that. Also, MakerDAO approved a $100 million stablecoin loan for a 151-year-old U.S. bank. This bank is actually right down the street from me where I live in the Philadelphia suburbs. It's called Huntington Valley Bank. And they're going to use it for a bunch of use cases, including uh, holding mortgages and holding... Uh, other type of real world assets. And then JP Morgan is bringing trillions of dollars to, to, to tokenize assets to DeFi specifically through their Onyx platform. And some of their customers include BlackRock as well as uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And uh, like I mentioned before, I ran a, a healthcare hyperledger special interest group. Uh, the way I ran it was mostly kind of like this in this format. 
uh, where we went over industry news, research action items uh, on a, a biweekly basis. And then I showed educational videos and, and links so that people could learn on the, these type of concepts on the fly. And these are more like newer articles, research papers, et cetera, that really uh, brought up more education, brought up more adoption. And so I proposed this to the financial market SIG. It has been uh, technically approved by Hyperledger and the different groups. We're still looking to work out exactly what days we would do this and what audiences are most interested in this, whether it's America's EMEA or it's APAC. Uh, and, and if we have an APAC representative who wants to run meetings uh, there for this as well. But Hyperledger definitely is, is aware that they want they need to do more in DeFi and they want to create more tools and, and open source technologies to connect DeFi into the hands of everyday people. And this is something I work on on a daily basis with my employer. And sorry for the branded uh, uh, deck here. I just, <laughs> these are the slides I had from other presentations. So I, I put it on there. Uh, I don't mean to shill anything uh, block payment, but I would love to have uh, the mortgage subgroup and other people that are part of this community uh, as, as, as members of the DeFi subgroup. Um, if anything, if you follow the financial market SIG, you'll be able to see updates on when this comes around. Hopefully we have our first meeting in August, but love to see you all there. If there's any questions, I'm open for them. Hey, uh, thanks, Mike. That was a fantastic presentation. I love the information that you're talking about. I, I love the, the way that you want to run the DeFi subgroup. It mimics a lot of the things that we're trying to do within the mortgage subgroup and definitely see the overlaps between the two. So any way that we can collaborate, any way that we can support your group, please let us know. I think this is a fantastic idea. And then there are a ton of questions going through my mind. I mean, that velocity, solvency, liquidity slide, in a, I think you definitely need to expand the solvency circle. It's not equal out. I, I just have all these thoughts going in my mind, but I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to monopolize this. So let's turn it over to the rest of the team and see if there are any questions or, or feedback for you. Okay. If there aren't any questions from the team, I know it's some of the questions that I had that I wrote down while you were going through it is a lot of the information that you're walking through, a lot of the use cases are US centric. There's a ton of stuff going on in DeFi in Europe, in Asia. And in fact, if you take a look at what's going on from an overall blockchain perspective, oftentimes they're further ahead than we are. To what extent are you taking a look at that, at, at those geographical areas for any guidance or points of collaboration? Yeah, 100%. Definitely APEC, Singapore, Australia, and uh, parts of Southeast and uh, Asia are somewhat light years ahead when it comes yeah. to uh, tokenizing assets. But they, they do it for uh, somewhat of a... It's like what you give up for ease of convenience of service and speed of that service is your security and your uh, you know, privacy when it comes to those services. And so in Asia, like also in China specifically, uh, they are able to tokenize uh, mortgages, they're able to tokenize like real world assets, but you have to give up every single detail and number and information yeah. into that to the, the government. And then you know, they, the government has the control to turn the on or off switch when it comes to your tokenized digital assets. And so those are some of the comparisons I'm seeing. Uh, I think the United States is uh, right now in the regulatory headwinds when it comes to all uh, the rest of the world, um, especially because you know you have multiple states that have different laws and jurisdictions and trying to create a federal mandate for this is going to be very tough for the United States to do, I think, in the interim. Uh, but yeah, I would say looking at the global view of this, like, yeah, you can go into south in the, you know, the east part of the world and do these things fairly easily with partners. Um, but at what cost do you do it at is the question I think you always should think about. Yeah, yeah, excellent point. Um, then one other question, and then uh, I, and we're at the, the end of our time. Um, what do you think is going to happen? Because a lot of DeFi right now is Ethereum-based. So what happens when they go from proof of work to proof of stake? Yeah, so from proof of work or proof of stake, uh, it's going to mean the validators of the network are a lot more important than just the miners. So I think MEV, minor extractable value, is going to be very key. In so here's the thing: like Lido, as I mentioned before, is one of the largest liquid staking providers. 
they have about 33% of the ETH market, but then 85% of overall crypto liquid staking across protocols. And so they also are partnered with this group very closely, their investors, and they know them in Flashbots, which creates a lot of MEV research. And within minor extractable value, it's either you're part of the team that's showcasing and understanding where the extractable value is coming from, or it's either you're the hunter or the hunted. And so a lot of times people are creating the tools to become the hunter. Uh, and you may have to go to a certain protocol and work with a certain group so you aren't the hunted in these dark forests of Ethereum or even other uh, protocols such as Cosmos, Tendermint, Polkadot, et cetera. And so uh, I believe that MEV now is the big difference between proof of work and proof of stake. And if you don't want your transactions to be taken by a bot or taken by uh, very sophisticated traders and individuals in the dark forest of, of crypto, you need to learn and understand MEV very, uh, very deeply. Great, great. Uh, I love your analogy of the dark forest. So that that, that was fantastic. Um, so I want to turn it over to the group because we're past the hour now. Any other questions for Mike on DeFi? Um, I think this is a fantastic idea for a subgroup. So any other questions or comments? Mike, just thanks for coming today and sharing. I think this is great information for our group. Awesome. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mike. Hope it was useful. Yeah, it was fantastic. Okay, um, so the, the last thing that I wanted to cover, and let's see if I can go back to our slide. There you go. Okay, the last thing I wanted to mention is our next um, meeting is going to be on August 11th. We have Karen, um, and I apologize if I mispronounce her last name, Belaza from the Ranieri Solutions Group. She's going to be speaking about blockchain and mortgage servicing. I'm really excited about this presentation. They're going to demo their new solution called Mentor. So uh, I highly encourage everyone to participate or, or, or to attend the August 11th meeting. I think that's going to be fantastic and really insightful. Um, I don't know if Karen is still on. Uh, I thought I saw her as a participant. Um, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, Karen, but if you wanted to just uh, say hi or, or mention anything, that'd be great. Um, if not, we can just go ahead and end the session. Sure. Happy to say hi. Uh, I'll have support from some of my other team members who are on the call right now. Um, super excited to present to this group and let you know we've been in the closet behind the curtain building this thing for a couple of years and we're ready now to show it to the industry. So. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Karen. Um, I know we've gone past the hour, so apologies to everyone for running long, but I think this was a great series of presentations. We will be making the recording for this and the presentation available to everyone on our subgroup wiki. With that, thank you to everyone for attending and have a great day.